great to see all of you here tonight. I'm John O'Keefe, and I'm a professor of theology here at Creighton, and I'm also the director of the Center for Catholic Thought at the university. And I would like to welcome you to the first in what we hope will be an ongoing annual series featuring a lecture by a prominent Catholic ecclesiastical leader who has demonstrated a strong commitment to the Catholic intellectual tradition. This year we certainly have such a person. It's my distinct honor to introduce to you Archbishop John R. Quinn. Archbishop Quinn was born in Riverside, California and ordained a priest for the Diocese of San Diego in 1953. He was a student at the North American College and did his philosophical and theological studies at the Gregorian University in Rome. Having served as an associate professor in a parish, he later taught theology and served as rector of San Diego Seminary and later as pastor of St. Therese Parish in San Diego. He was named Auxiliary Bishop of San Diego when he was just 38 years old. He subsequently served as Archbishop of Oklahoma City and as Archbishop of San Francisco. From 1977 to 1980, he served as president of the Episcopal Conference of the United States. <clears throat> After resigning as Archbishop of San Francisco in 1995, he was given a fellowship at Campion Hall, the Jesuit House of Studies at Oxford University. There he delivered a lecture on the occasion of the centennial of that famous Oxford House. That lecture, which explored the relationship between papal primacy and the desire for Christian unity, later evolved into his important book, The Reform of the Papacy. Many people in this room, however, will know him best through his publications in the weekly Catholic magazine, America. In that venue, he has established himself as an insightful observer of the changing face of American Catholicism and of the ways in which American, American Catholics interact with the church's leadership. In addition to his many Episcopal and intellectual achievements, Archbishop Quinn has also taught at the University of San Diego, Santa Clara University, and the University of San Francisco, two of which are fellow Jesuit institutions. Tonight, he's teaching us here at Creighton University about the significant and often overlooked impact of the First Vatican Council Please join me in wel welcoming to Creighton Archbishop John R. Quinn as he addresses us on the topic Vatican Council I, the Distortions and the Facts. I want to thank uh, John for his very kind words and his uh, very attentive hospitality since my arrival here, and it's very great help to me in preparing to come for this occasion. I'm grateful to Father Schlegel for the invitation which he issued to me to come here. We go back a long time. We had a wonderful working relationship when Father Schlegel was the president of the University of San Francisco. This gives me the opportunity also to make a personal testimonial to the Society of Jesus where you heard I was a student at the Gregorian University, which was founded by St. Ignatius in the year 1553. But uh, I have been the beneficiary of Jesuit amiability, of Jesuit learning, and Jesuit holiness since I was 19 years old. And I welcome this opportunity to express my deep felt, lifelong gratitude to so many wonderful Jesuits whom I have known. Now, before I go any further with anything else, I want to explain to you what this is, because everybody will see it, and you will wonder, and most will be afraid to ask. This is a tumor, and it is in the parotid gland where you get mumps, and it um, is right below the ear, of course. Well, to cut through all the details of this, I consulted at my doctor's urging, I consulted a specialist, a professor of medicine at the university in San Francisco. He explained to me that these tumors rarely become malignant. He explained to me that if they were to try to do a surgical intervention now, 
that they would certainly sever the facial nerve and that I would have other problems. And there is no pain accompanying this uh, wonder. So uh, he advised me to just leave it alone. So that's what I do. I want to also, before I get into anything too serious here, to uh, thank you for coming this evening. It's a uh, testimonial to the living faith in this community that you would come on a Wednesday night to hear a talk about the First Vatican Council. But I am particularly uh, grateful to the many young people and students who are here tonight. And I think it is a great tribute to this university to have attracted such students and that they would themselves sacrifice a wonderful evening they might have for some other action or enterprise and uh, come to this, this talk. So I'm very honored by her presence here tonight. Well, at 9 o'clock in the morning, December 8, 1869, a procession of 774 bishops entered St. Peter's Basilica to open the First Vatican Council. Well, the basilica was filled with people who had been coming in since 7 o'clock that morning from various countries. Outside, there was a torrential rain. So after the Mass, each of the more than 700 bishops present made his individual act of respect and obedience to the Pope. Well, this lasted more than an hour and a half. Following some of formalities of this kind, the Pope then gave a discourse. He stood at his chair. He held the text in one hand, in his left hand, and gesturing with the other, here and there, he was overcome by emotion as he spoke. The opening mass and the ceremonies lasted some six hours, and it was around three o'clock in the afternoon when the bishops finally emerged into the pouring rain to try to find a carriage to take them back to their lodgings. The idea of a council had been germinating for nearly 20 years. It was Cardinal Lambruschini, Secretary of State to the previous Pope, who had first raised the issue with Pope Pius IX. He wrote a letter to him in 1848, urging him to consider a council because of the social and civil disorder following the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, and also because of the rise of currents of thought deemed to be harmful to faith. Some of these kinds of problems, for instance, arose from new discoveries in archaeology and paleontology, how was it possible, scholars asked themselves, to hold to the biblical account of the creation of the world in seven 24-hour days? <clears throat> These new discoveries were raising issues for the meaning of the Bible. They were also raising more philosophical and ideological issues such as rationalism, the idea that there was no need for the supernatural, that human reason was all self-sufficient. Now, while these two examples do not exhaust the multitude of the new ideas which raise problems for faith, they do serve to indicate why there was growing concern by Rome about the whole attitude toward the supernatural, toward divine revelation, toward matters of faith. It was the continuing concern about these kinds of problems 
that led Pope Pius IX to publish in 1864 what was known as the Syllabus of Errors. The Syllabus was a list of 80 statements or propositions, and all 80 of these propositions represented things that were condemned. They were 80 condemned propositions. The list was drawn from the writings, the speeches, and the official documents of Pius IX. But the syllabus did not accomplish its purpose. It did not defend the faith. Its individual condemnatory propositions were cited without giving any context and thus they were difficult, if not impossible, to interpret for the reader or for the governments who did not take the trouble to go through all the writings and all the speeches of Pius IX in order to discover the context and therefore the meaning. So the syllabus was not successful. But it did create widespread reaction. And the memory of the syllabus lingered on, particularly in the minds of governments, because some of the propositions contained in the syllabus condemned the separation of church and state, the freedom of religion, and the freedom of the press, and many other things. Because the syllabus had not been effective, and because the threat was continually growing, because of these philosophical and ideological currents, it is no surprise that a major issue at Vatican Council I in 1870 was faith, the faith of the believer in the modern world and the defense of divine revelation. And so the first document produced by Vatican Council I is a well-written, rich, positive statement on faith and reason. It was very different from the syllabus. It was persuasive, positive, affirmative, and well done. It is important to call attention to the fact that this first decree of the Council on Faith was also a clear defense of human reason and its capacity to know truth. Vatican Council I was a vigorous defense of reason as well as of faith. Next on the agenda after reason and faith was the Council's treatment of the Church. This went through a number of revisions. The first draft was given to the bishops on January 21st, 1870. The Jesuit Clemens Schroeder was the chief author of this draft. And he used the syllabus as the basis of his work. Well, the bishops criticized the draft. First of all, they said it was too academic. But the more substantial criticism was that the draft document on the church focused entirely on the Pope. In the discussion on the council floor, bishops pointed out that this was supposed to be a decree on the church, and yet it contained nothing about the bishops or the ecumenical councils. 